Hello and welcome to Making Waves, a series of short online chats with people who, through their work, help shape and lead the environmental movement here in Ireland. In Making Waves, we explore the diverse, energetic and sometimes revolutionary ways in which the greatest environmental issues affecting our oceans and the wider world are tackled. In this series, we focus on research, policy, agriculture, activism and community engagement. Here's Sinead Mercier. Sinead is a climate change and just transition consultant who for the past decade has been researching climate change and the policies that are best placed to fix it. I have been following you for a while on Twitter and looking at some of the stuff you've written. The range of things that you tackle is so wide and also gives me such a view on the complexity of creating a sustainable way of living. And in some ways the ocean mirrors that complexity. It's in, in unknowable. What's your way in? How do you come to terms with complexity in this area? I suppose rather than seeing it in a very kind of techn technic technological kind of way, it's about dialogue and kind of, it's kind of like, our relationship with nature or with the, with uh, the world around us is kind of like a, a friendship or not to anthropomorphize it or but it's kind of like a, a relationship you, you kind of have to build that relationship day on day kind of going to visit the sea now and again or attending a protest now and again while there's nothing that you can really replace with maybe a long and kind of quiet education process or even just walking in nature kind of walking around it like Tim Robinson did when he wrote his beautiful books about Connemara and mapping the land but to do that uh, it's very hard because there's just so many topics and so many things it's, you have to make it very personal and I kind of try and put a lens in it that that works for myself and uh, that lens is post-colonialism <laughs> 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 so obviously I connect everything to uh, the imperialists. No, I don't. I won't even. <laughs> but I try to kind of, I suppose, you, understanding our heritage and our, is the most important way personally. Now, this is my own personal perspective and how I find myself fitting nature and continually being fascinated by it is how connected it is to human history and our own history as a nation or as a people. How I kind of, I think that that hu very human relationship or historical relationship, you can't have, th that's kind of, for me, how I um, speak about such a massive topic and try and think about a massive topic. Uh, yeah. You've written recently about how the idea or the mantra of personal responsibility to help the environment can be a cover for the underlying system which is designed to extract and burn. And I, I always think about that because I do a little bit of picking up rubbish and you're always conscious of, are you yourself masking the problem? And, but then I think maybe it's not about necessarily to pick up the rubbish, things like the two minute beach clean or any kind of tidy town stuff that it's really just about building the networks and litter picking is like a gateway drug into the heavy stuff like <laughs> dismantling the entire system in which civilization is built. Yes, I think you're right. I think it is a gateway drug. I suppose how I would see a solution um, is perhaps getting people invested in the land and the sea, uh, not only from a cleanliness point of view, but say your jobs or your life being directly connected to it. Um, so oyster and mussel farms, for example, if, if the sea is, is polluted, they can't sell their produce. Um, you also have problems with seaweed as well here. A lot of uh, small farmers, it's very marginal land, hill farming, um, kind of Kunamahar land uh, and a lot of those farmers would supplement their income with traditional seaweed cutting and you can make 30 grand a year off it which is a big income um, and you can send it a lot of children have been sent to college on that uh, so it, it's kind of this that removal of ownership from local people and having been invested in clean seaweed or clean food production and then separating it from those people into 
like a, a corporation that has no care for its workers, has no care for the land that it comes from, um, those are questions we have to ask. It's like Fergal said, if, if you have a metis and knowing and living with nature day in, day out, you're far less likely to destroy it. Um, and I think that's very basic, <laughs> very basic knowledge, really. <laughs> Finally, as the, uh, the, the sun comes out here, uh, maybe we could finish on an optimistic note. What is it that gives you hope in your jobs when bombarded with so much bad news? Sinead Mercier, through your job in research, you come across an awful lot of bad news, but your Twitter bio says you're a militant optimist. Why do you still have hope? Um, yes, well, I suppose I do actually have a lot of hope. Just even they were, the environmental movement in Ireland and environmentalism generally, I mean, UCC as well, I spoke at the conference there. They have a brilliant law and environment conference every year. And it, it's a wonderful movement. I think there's an awful lot of positivity and kindness and kind of supporting each other, even if you don't fully agree. I mean, there's a lot of things. I um, My environmentalism comes a lot from my parents as well. So my dad has this very cute uh, book called On Nador, where he collects Irish language words about the environment and nature. And uh, But a lot of kind of those perspectives, like David Attenborough, for example, a wonderful person himself, they, they kind of tend to move into kind of overpopulation as being the problem, which I would disagree with. And I know Exor in Ireland do as well, but they're coming from a good place. And they're, I think that that's very positive. I think that there is a kind of wellspring of positivity and kindness, but it's sort of, and um, the underlying uh, focus is good, but say things like natural gas, there's, there's kind of a bit of a debate still in Ireland about whether natural gas and Europe as well, is a transition fuel and the evidence just is that it isn't i mean the methane that it releases alone um could tip us over and has in 2018 the world's largest emission spike actually came from methane from frack but um i suppose where the hope is for me is even just going back to the irish for environment there's kind of two words that are generally used there's um timpelucht which means the environment is kind of out there it's around us timpel urn uh, but the kind of Irish word that's kind of used um, more generally or kind of locally and um, I suppose would be the more correct Irish word is coheal, which means the lived in life. And it means that nature is not separate from us or something out there um, to be taken from. And for me, the just transition kind of language and, and perspective is the most fruitful one at, at the moment. Like I'm even seeing, I speak on Irish language radio and television quite a lot. And uh, at the very beginning, I would kind of get like a bit of, you know, actually not really from the Irish language uh, radio, but generally I would get a bit of stick um, on environmental matters or kind of being like, oh yeah, that tree hugger, that tree hugger, I won't say the word. But <laughs> and uh, what's kind of happened more and more as I speak in this language and work more with maybe people in the Midlands, trade unions or community groups or small businesses trying to um, pr uh, pursue an alternative for the region, people understand that and the, there's a lot of good work that, that can be done in, in peatland regeneration, same regenerative agriculture as well in the Midlands and even out here in Connemara and I think that language, understanding that people are in very kind of strange circumstances, especially after the recession, people didn't cut turf during the boom uh, because they had money to buy alternatives or to heat the home in a different way. They only went back to cutting turf, which is back-breaking work um, when the recession hit and they didn't have money for alternatives. And even today, we sit of 2,800 people dying every year from energy poverty, so cold-related illnesses every winter. And I think those voices and those stories, travellers, for example, 12% um, of travellers, they would spend maybe 100 euro a week, 108 euro a week on fuel, um, while only getting maybe 100 euro if, if they're not working in unemployment because it's very difficult for them to get work because of discrimination and education opportunities. Um, so you'd have two people under 26 uh, getting 100 euro a week and then spending 180 euro of that on fuel. And those perspectives and that language is more and more coming in as, say, Vincent de Paul or traveller organisations become more comfortable with climate language. And I think that for me is the hope. I think understanding that these aren't kind of hobbyist environmentalist practices that we can go back to our cosy homes at the end of the day after 
um, litter picking on the beach and tweeting about it. I think understanding that that person also might go home to a very, very cold home and no job or difficult circumstances. Um, and understanding that cleaning the beach is so far out of their thinking because they can't feed themselves or you know, mm. that kind of thing. And that for me is, is the hope that that language becomes compassionate and understanding and that we move to solve those problems along with uh, environmental issues because the two are to so connected. You, you can't separate them out. It's like the word co-heal. This isn't about team palacht. It's not separate. It's for it's all of us together. And I think that for me is the hope um, and I hope it's understood. So. Thank you. <laughs>